Wilson. So I, it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Greg Hageman is actually the head of our translational research uh, group here at Moran Eye Center. And he's going to talk about some of the work that they're doing in terms of macular degeneration. And again, this being Translational Research Day, I'm really excited to have some of our researchers come in and educate us as clinicians as to what's going on and what the potential applications are going to be in clinical practice. So, Dr. Hegman. Okay, wonderful to be here and a real pleasure to tell you a little bit about what we're doing uh, at the newly named uh, Sharon Eccles Steele Center for Translational Medicine. So Sharon has been a great supporter of uh, all the work we've done since I've been here over seven years. Uh, and a couple weeks ago, we actually celebrated the dedication of the center in her name. So um, the center really derived from a lot of conversations I had with Randy Olson uh, back when I was at the University of Iowa. And for those of you that know Randy, he's pretty persistent. Um, he, he talked a lot about getting me to come here. I thought, no, I'm, I'm headed to industry uh, to do translational work in industry. Uh, but the more I talked with this man, the more I realized that we had a real opportunity to do something unique here uh, in Utah. And that was the beginning of the Center for Translational Medicine. The sole focus of the Center for Translational Medicine, at least in the early years, uh, was really focused on age-related macular degeneration. And really, to dig deep into the disease, to understand pathways that are active in the disease in the back of the eye and systemically, to identify targets from those pathways, so druggable targets, let's, let's really get to that point, and ultimately to develop therapies for the disease. You know, and the center, I think, was, was based on a, a unique concept, and that was, can we really partner with the pharmaceutical industry in a truly interactive fashion, right? I was used to making discoveries, filing patents, and licensing those patents off to industry, and that's the last you ever saw. Uh, the concept here was to find a pharmaceutical group that we could truly work with, and we could truly do the, oops, the part that we do well, we, could, we can do the science very well. Industry can do drug development and target validation and those types of things very well. But what if we could truly pull these groups together and, and in a very synergistic form? And the, the goal really being to shorten this timeline of drug development from discovery of targets uh, to actually treatment of patients. So we actually did that. We had an incredible partnership for four and a half years with Allergan. Uh, it was more than I ever dreamed it would be. We truly shortened that time period uh, substantially. Unfortunately, they were purchased last year. We're out looking for a new partner, and I had hoped we would uh, be able to introduce a new partner today, but I think we're close. So if I look back six years, game changers in all of this. Um, of course, the pharmaceutical partnership was important, but uh, people are the key. And you know, I have been incredibly fortunate here at the Moran uh, to work with this incredibly talented group of individuals, both in the CTM uh, and uh, in the community, et cetera. Uh, key partnerships, partnerships have been absolutely important. Um, some of the key partnerships are listed here. Uh, but certainly the Lion's Eye Bank, the access to human donor tissues has been an incredible partnership. Uh, but lots of partnerships with Intermountain Healthcare, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think intellectual property has been very important to this overall 
uh, progress that we've made, and that's, that goes a little against the grain of typical academics. So it's actually been difficult for me to not publish uh, when we've made uh, important discoveries, but it's an important part of doing true translational medicine, I think. So we've generated uh, probably more patents than we uh, could have generated publications. And I think most crucial to, to the studies we've done in macular degeneration has been access to resources uh, and important tools. And the resources that have been most important in our efforts, um, certainly this access to human donor tissues. I've been pursuing this line of research um, for, uh, for probably 30 years now, pushing 30 years and really started back when we realized that there's not a good animal model for macular degeneration. There's never likely will be a good model for this disease. And if you're going to look at human disease, let's get to the real source. Um, so we currently have a repository now of, of, of somewhere over 7,500 pairs of eyes produced uh, in identical fashion. And you can see that one of the one of the real messages here is it takes large numbers to do good science. Um, so it sounds like a lot of eyes, but when I show you kind of the process we've gone through, uh, it really is not. Patient cohorts, on the other hand, have been incredibly valuable uh, as we've moved forward. Uh, and we have access to about 70, 80,000 DNA samples currently in the Center for Translational Medicine. So those of you that are familiar with macular degeneration, I think you'll agree with this comment that there are really, there's a huge diversity uh, of phenotypes, both for early stage disease, drusen, there's all kinds of drusen, and if you get to the histological level, you'll realize that there's even more phenotypes of drusen. And certainly you're familiar with lots of different forms of late stage disease, particularly neovascular disease. And I think we're starting to lose the plot here clinically uh, in identifying some of these subtypes of neovascular disease, polypoidal, rap lesions, choroidal, uh, etc. But we thought one of the most important things we could contribute is asking the question, are there true genotype phenotype associations in this disease? Okay, and so to get us to that point um, became really important to understand the background genetics of the disease. Uh, in my particular group, uh, we've been looking at genetics of macular degeneration for somewhere over 20 years now. Um, but I want to leave you with an important message, and that is there are two major loci that are associated with risk for developing this disease in Caucasians, okay? Uh, one on chromosome one, and that, that locus contains complement factor H and the factor H related genes. And a second major locus on chromosome 10 that compares, uh, contains a pair of genes, ARMS2 and HTRA1. Make the point again that over 95% of all risk uh, is associated with these two loci. Okay, so it's really this gigantic gift. But I think on the scientific side, we've kind of whitewashed that a bit by wanting to go out and find more and more genes. And yes, there are a lot of minor gene associations, but if you're really going to dig into the disease and understand pathways, you need to work on the two big ones. Put another way, clinically, um, if you look at my combined patient cohorts, um, only 5% of our AMD cases, grades 1B through 4C using the Rotterdam scale, only 5% of those cases don't carry any risk alleles at chromosome 1, chromosome 10, or C3. And I recently went through these 161 cases, and there's a lot of misdiagnosed AMD in those cases, Stargardt's disease, pseudoxanthoma, elasticum, et cetera, et cetera. And, and probably the remaining bit uh, is, is, is associated with some of these minor gene associations. So the strategy we've used um, from day one is we knew we needed a really robust understanding of the genetics before we could do anything. Again, we're lucky, two major genes. Um, resources became critical, and this is the piece that the pharmaceutical industry just doesn't have access to. They don't have access to these human tissues. Uh, in fact, none of my colleagues in Europe have access to these kinds of tissues and patient resources. And this has been really important. We can do lots and lots of good science, but without the knowledge of genetics and the resources, I don't think we'll ever get to this place where we're really finding true druggable targets for the disease. 
So just a little bit about the genetics. Chromosome 10, as I said, contains these two genes, ARMS2, HTRA1. It's been a real enigma as to which of those genes, or perhaps both of these genes, uh, play a role in actually causing risk for the disease. Um, this very interesting genetic block, strong linkage disequilibrium, but it becomes quite simple uh, after you make it really complex. And there's a single uh, variant, this A69S variant, tags all risk for this disease, at least in Caucasians again. And so that makes things a bit simpler. The chromosome 1 locus is a little bit rougher, uh, 360 kilobases, contains complement factor H in a truncated isoform of factor H called truncated. Um, and five of these so-called factor H uh, related genes um, and numbered, of course, one through five. If you look at haplotypes across this locus, a couple of really important points to leave you with. There are two major risk haplotypes, so not a single risk haplotype. More importantly, two major protective haplotypes. And those protective haplotypes are the most significantly associated haplotypes with AMD, but skewed towards the protection. And that's played very prominently uh, in our thinking about developing therapeutics for this disease. In addition, if things weren't tough enough, there's a neutral allele. So, and I'll leave you with one clinical thought. I think, you know, if, if you're doing genotyping and you say, oh, my patient's carrying one risk allele of factor eight, so he's, he or she is at increased risk for developing uh, the disease. It actually turns out that that's not true if this major risk allele is, is present with a second allele that's protection. So protection at this locus rules the day uh, every time. So we spent a lot of time in Iowa looking for biological relationships between chromosome 1 and 10 biology, and we were never able to identify a direct biological interaction between those two pathways, uh, and that has held true. Uh, we should have thought about this a long time ago. Uh, as I've gone around looking at patients in Africa and Asia and Easter Island, um, one striking observation is that Africans are mostly characterized by drusen. In fact, we've seen maybe one choroidal neovascular lesion that's due to AMD uh, in our African cohort from Ghana. Asia, on the other hand, the disease is primarily neovascular um, and very little in the way of drusen uh, preceding disease development. And it turns out that the African genetics all skewed towards chromosome 1, and the Asian genetics all skewed towards chromosome 10. More recently, we've seen a lot of skewing towards chromosome 10 in the Native American population uh, and others. So uh, it turns out Caucasians are a mixture of the two, and it, it makes for an interesting uh, set of studies. Um, but we thought at that time, wow, this is probably two very different diseases. And so we need to really dig in and look at what is chromosome 1 doing all by itself in the absence of 10 and, and, the, and the reverse. And so we've done a lot of that, and I don't have time to show you today. But we've addressed this at the ocular level, genetic, mechanistic, gene expression that goes on and on, and systemically through blood biomarkers through blood cell composition, co-segregating disease. And the message that I really want to leave you with today is that we strongly believe that macular degeneration is at least two major diseases. And it means that those diseases, that a lot of patients will carry both diseases. And here's one example, one of the early examples with genetics. If we reach into these cohorts that we have from Iowa, Melbourne, and Utah, and we look at the association of what I call pure chromosome 1, uh, which are homozygous risk at 1 with no background risk at chromosome 10, and pure chromosome 10, risk at 10, no risk at 1. And you look at the association with AMD, you see the strong association of both genes. They're both driving geographic atrophy and choroidal neovascular disease. Um, but the striking observation is chromosome 10 does not associate with early stage disease, and that means basically drusen. It doesn't associate with drusen formation. And if you dig in clinically and start pulling out 
these groups, these pure chromosome ones and tens, uh, you'll find that the chromosome one group is driven by the formation of drusen. Drusen are much less prominent in the chromosome tens, and you can see a lot of other clinical features uh, that are different between uh, the two. There's this obvious optic nerve issue that skews with chromosome 10. We've been chasing that a long time. And there's a whole plethora of differences between chromosome 1 patients and chromosome 10 patients. I'm going to go through those very quickly uh, since most of the audience is clinical. Uh, but if you just look, uh, of course, this Drusen observation comes screaming out. Chromosome 1 patients are strongly uh, associated with the development of large macular AREDs, grade 3 Drusen in the macula, pigment epithelial detachments. 55% of our chromosome 1 patients over the age of 60 show this phenotype uh, in contrast to about 8% of our chromosome 10 patients. Histologically, you can see here's a donor that had large soft macular drusen. You can see the phenotype very nicely. Again, chromosome 1 very much characterized by these sub-RPE deposits, pigmented epithelial de uh, detachments. And interestingly, in the donor eyes, very often the separation between the RPE and the Brooks membrane, which I think is important from a bio biological mechanism. Chromosome 10 patients, very little in the way of drusen. You can see here's a little drusen. They tend to have these cuticular drusen that don't move or change shape uh, with, with aging. Um, and the retinas, I think you'll all appreciate if you look at these on moss like this, the retinas seem thinner than the chromosome 1 patients. Chromosome 10 patients histologically, if they do separate, they separate between the retina and the RPE, so very different uh, separation. Phil Luthert, uh, a very good pathologist from Moorfields, was here the last uh, few weeks looking at this, and he said, these look dodgy. And, and remember, they're all fixed in the same period of time, so we're, we're working hard to quantify what the differences are. Um, but one interesting clinical observation is the chromosome 10 retinas are thinner across the board, beginning from an age about 40 or 50 years of, old, of age. The retinal and choroidal vasculature is far less dense uh, in the chromosome tens than it is in the ones. You can see that here. Uh, on average, about 30 to 40 percent lower vascular density. We thought we could really dig into this heavily with uh, OCT angiography, and it's just not quite there yet. So we'll have to continue to do it the hard way. Fluid distribution in neovascular phenotype are very different in the chromosome ones and tens. Uh, the chromosome one patients strongly characterized by the accumulation of subretinal, sub-RPE fluid uh, in comparison to the chromatomes, chromosome 10 patients characterized primarily by intraretinal fluid. Uh, phenotype, you can see this was grading that was done. I think Al sitting in the back. Al uh, helped us a lot with this early on. Um, chromosome 10 patients very much skewed towards a, a classification of classic CMV as compared to chromosome 1s, which are graded primarily as classics, probably speaking to the type of neovascularization. And we think that 10 is largely associated with RAC lesions and have certainly shown that to be true in a Japanese cohort. The response to anti-VEGF agents varies dramatically between the chromosome 1 and 10 patients. Basically, your patients that take injection after injection and kind of maintain vision are your chromosome 1 patients. I don't have a lot of time to talk about the biology, but the bio bi biological manifestations of these two diseases also differ dramatically. Um, we've seen incredible uh, associations of histological features with 1 in 10. Uh, basal laminar deposits, for example, strongly driven by chromosome 10 as compared to chromosome 1. Serum biomarkers, blood composition are dramatically different in the two uh, groups. And I'm going to show you one example, gene expression, which is really getting down to the nitty gritty of what pathways are chromosomes 1 and 10 driving. And we've been very fortunate, this relationship with Allergan, uh, the one thing that it did do is it gave us the opportunity to run this huge gene expression study. And basically, without going into details, I'm um, sorry about that, 
we used seven pure genotype groups with about 50 donors and, and 50 patients per group, uh, 1,400 total samples. Um, and this platform, this particular platform we used was called the Diaxon HIT platform, uh, 6 million probes for 23,000 genes, and we generated about 8 billion uh, data points. But more than any other experiment, this has really started to teach us about pathways that are driven specifically by 1 and 10. There's no good way to show that, of course, so this is actually, this is real data. Uh, and you can see that there are dramatic differences in gene expression profiles between 1s and 10s. And we looked at macula, extra macula, RPE choroid, and retina, so four pieces of tissue for each donor. Um, what we have learned, we've learned a ton about ocular sites um, of gene expression. And that becomes uh, particularly important on chromosome 1. Where is complement factor H actually being made? Uh, and we've had some surprises on that front. We've learned a ton about biological mechanisms. And then we've been able to use the data to go back into the same eyes and show that, that yes, indeed, those mechanisms truly are active. And we've learned a lot about, about potential targets for drug development. So I'll give you one example. Um, the complement system is, of course, comprised of about 85, 90 different proteins. And for the first time, we have a very robust understanding of what's happening in the back of the eye uh, with the complement system. And that becomes very important when you start thinking about, you know, is factor D antibody treatment really the right way to go? Do we have any data whatsoever that factor D is upregulated or downregulated in the back of the eye and that we need to inhibit it? And that story goes on. We've had a lot of surprises here. Um, and we've been able to take that gene expression data and combine it with RNA sequence data and functional data and protein distribution data, et cetera, et cetera, um, and really show that the pathways that, that we think are good candidates for drug development truly are that. And I'll leave you with the message that really these are just examples of haplotypes across that chromosome 1 locus uh, and their association with the presence or absence of macular degeneration. Uh, no AMD being the brown bar, AMD being the blue bar. And you can certainly see in the case of chromosome 1, our therapies need to mimic uh, this highly protective uh, haplotype in the form of the disease. I think uh, we would have probably had drug in patients sometime in 2017 if we would have been able to maintain the allergen uh, relationship, uh, but we are ready uh, to treat chromosome 1 and we're ready to do it in the right patients. Chromosome 10, I would have stood up six months ago and said it's a difficult locus, we're not making much progress. Uh, but the team has really made some, some important discoveries. And I think this very complicated locus that I described early, we are now at a place uh, where we think we have really found the region of frank causality within that locus. And that knowledge is really quickly pointing us to the mechanisms that are active in chromosome 10 disease. Um, and hopefully next year I'll really be able to tell you uh, the end of the story. So I want to leave you with a few messages. Um, hopefully the message that, that all of you will take home uh, is that AMD is very, very likely uh, two distinct biological diseases. Um, do these minor genes play a role? Probably modulating to some degree, but we've looked at that a lot using the same strategies and we don't see a lot of these actually uh, being causal for macular degeneration. We've learned a lot about the underpinning biology of both chromosome 1 and 10 directed disease. Um, we've identified critical pathways, mechanisms, and targets. Uh, we're really at the place where I think on chromosome 1 we're ready for uh, developing treatments, uh, chromosome 10 a little farther behind. And I think I hate the, seeing this, this situation out there where I think potentially good drugs are failing trials uh, because of lack of this knowledge. And so certainly one thing we will do here at the Moran is group our patients appropriately for trials. I, I envision the first um, trial with a chromosome 1 directed drug to be directed towards chromosome 1 patients, not with chromosome 10 in the background, right? 
two very different pathways. And I think it's obvious why some complement inhibitors have failed in trials because they have a huge amount of chromosome 10 in the background. Um, so let's not lose potentially effective drugs for the wrong reasons. So with that, I'll stop. Happy to take any questions. Greg? So, uh, fantastic. I've loved following it so long. But here's a chance for me to talk to all the clinicians here in the room. This is an example where we very much would be involved. Uh, you know, he's got a group ready, prepared to look at patients, but who's seeing the patients? We are. And uh, the group that they need to look at, they want to look at people with macular degeneration. The more we can get, the more robust. And, and it's hard to look at them and to differentiate, but th that can be done. Also interested in people who are younger with a family history of macular degeneration. And frankly, probably one of the shortages are people who are older who really don't have any changes in the retina at all. Those people over 70 or 80, you know, you see them, they don't have any druse or anything, but what I like to call them is super normal. And uh, uh, if you're not sure, that's fine, but if you, I found all you need to do is you just say, listen, we're really working hard on macular degeneration, and often these people either have a family history or they're older, they know people, and said, could you give us a few minutes? You let your clinic coordinator, uh, they'll talk to Jill and her team, everything else is taken care of, it doesn't take very long, I've never had a complaint about it, but all of us seeing patients here can help dramatically expanding those cohorts to help us to where we can further understand this disease. And remember, the future treatment's gonna be pure ones, pure tens, and there's no place in the country that has large groups of these, and we have large groups and we need larger. So just a shout out in regards to that. All of us can be involved in this, and I think it's gonna be really important. We, we announced this major partner, uh, it, it's to hit the ground running. We, we wanna move this into new core treatments getting at the basis of the disease. Thanks, Randy. I appreciate that. I also want to, you know, it was a little bit remiss not thanking those of you that are out in private practice. I know a lot of you have spent a lot of your time helping us with records from, from our eye donors and also sending patients. So thanks for that. Thank you, Dr. Eggman. 